Let us go ahead and begin our service this morning. And uh, uh, Homer, would you open us in a word of prayer, please, brother? Mm. Amen. If you would, please open your Bibles to uh, John chapter 11 as we continue our study in chapter 11 of John. Um, a lot of markings in my Bible, but not that particular place. There we go. And as we begin this morning, we're really looking at the raising of Lazarus, but I'm, this, I want us to focus this morning primarily on, I am the resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection in this chapter. There's so much as we've talked about in this chapter already. We've talked about how truly this one has got the, this particular uh, incident or this particular event. Yeah, of, of all the miracles that we see in the Bible, it really has, as far as in the New Testament is concerned, it really has more, uh, more context than any of the others. It's one of the largest that's recorded. Of course, it's only recorded in John, but there's a lot of surrounding, uh, a lot that surrounds this particular thing. We've seen how the circumstances and the events make it so very uh, instructive. There's so many things, so many different lessons, individual kind of lessons that we can learn from it. There's just it's a wonderful thing to, to see and try to put ourselves at that time, maybe in the event, and along with John as he's recording what he has actually witnessed, uh, to be there with them to some extent and to see these things or to know it from as God has miraculously given it to him to know. We know that the miracle itself is also a wonderful thing because it's proof of Christ's ministry itself, of the very mission that he had. But you know, it's also something else and even much greater than that. In all earnestness, it was that which was the crowning proof of Christ's own resurrection. And the wonderful thing about this is particularly is we can see it not only as what it's going, <coughs> excuse me, as to what it's going to be in that, in that area, but also it's a great demonstration to us of what we can expect. And I hope we see that this morning in our study. We should remember, as we've seen last week in our study, we looked at faith primarily, and it's continuing on through our study. But one thing also to think about, too, is what really took place. We know how Jesus was about 25 miles away from, uh, from, from Bethany, which is where this event take, where, where uh, Lazarus uh, is, is and, he's, and, and the uh, people come, the messengers come, to tell him that, he's, that Lazarus is very sick, and they're asking him, to, to do something about that. Now, we know that Jesus could have simply spoken a word, as he did with the centurion, and, and fixed it like that. There's many different things he could have done, but the one thing I think that they least expected was he didn't, he didn't do anything. He let them know, nope, don't, don't do anything for a couple of days. And then we know his, his apostles looked at him trying to say, you're, a couple of days, you're just hanging around. What are we doing? Lazarus needs your help. And we saw how that took place. And we, then we saw some other things. We saw how, how when Jesus finally decides to go, he, he makes it very clear that, Jesus, that Lazarus is not sick. He's actually dead. He's already died. So now they're going to go. And so now it makes even less sense because there's a great threat for him in, um, uh, in, in Jerusalem and around that area. They know about that. And here they're going right back into the lion's den. And there they say, you know, Lord, don't you understand what you're doing? And we saw how Thomas steps up, and he speaks for all the disciples, and he says, if you go, we're going to go with you, even though he believed that it could cost him his death. So this morning, we're going to pick it up basically in chapter uh, 11 in verse, I believe it's, uh, I'm not quite there yet, but we're, uh, it's going to be a, a little further down, where we're going to pick up where Jesus actually comes into, uh, actually gets the, gets, gets the Bethany and what the events are that surround that, that thing. But we should learn something from what we just saw. And one of the big lessons here is Jesus, we sometimes can think that we have been forgotten about. We sometimes think that he doesn't hear our prayers. You know something? If we pray in earnestness and truly and, and are real, we're surrendered to the Lord, he almost always answers our prayers in one way or another. Sometimes it's an instantaneous answer, and we say, wow, thank you, Lord, I got, I got that answer to that prayer. Sometimes we're walking in a situation we can pray, and we see an instantaneous result. 
But other times, it's not like that. It's delayed. And oftentimes, when the answer actually comes, we may not even recognize that God has just answered that prayer. Our Lord answered the prayer. We may recognize it later, and we need to thank Him for it. But it's a lesson here that we should learn, and that's one of the lessons I think we're going to see this morning. That, there's, that the Lord sometimes delays in His answers, and it's not necessarily a denial to that prayer. It's not necessarily a denial. He delays for a number of reasons, but primarily we need to realize that all that the Lord does is for the glory of God, isn't it? As ours should be. It's always to the glory of God and always realize that He does love us. Very proof of all that we see, He loves us beyond any measure we can even fathom. So as we get into these things, it can be a real challenge sometimes to get into these things, particularly with things like we're dealing with here this morning. One thing we want to kind of think about is what we learn in Isaiah 58, when the Bible says, the Lord says, He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are or your ways, my ways, saith the Lord. Now we read that statement and say, okay, well, I understand that. But think about it for a minute, the depth of what that really is saying. He is so far beyond us, so far. His ways are so much more than us. And His understanding, unfathomable, all of these things are His ways. And we in our little minds think sometimes we know better than God does. Or we don't think God knows what He's doing, or we don't understand it. And oftentimes we can't. But He goes on to say, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So always think about that, that, that statement of what the Lord has to say concerning these things. He is always right. Let us, ne- let us therefore not complain or be discouraged when we get into challenges just simply because we cannot understand what God is doing. And it's easy to do, isn't it, my friends? Our faith can wane from time to time, can it? Certainly we see the example with the apostles. We see Thomas and all of them boldly going with the Lord here. We know just before his crucifixion, the Lord plainly lets them know what's going on. They see what's going on. They let them know, yes, Lord, we're going to be there with you. We're going to go through it. And what do they do? They all scatter. It happens, doesn't it? It doesn't make it wrong. We can lose that, 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 that kind of confidence and courage that we should have. We want to always, though, remember that His way is always perfect, isn't it? It's perfect in timing and in purpose. And that's what the case is here this morning. This is perfect this morning, what He's doing, both in timing and, and in purpose. Let us just simply trust Him. We see in, in verse 40 in John chapter 11, he says, when he says, uh, he said, I, I, Say I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see what? The glory of God. The glory of God. This is for the glory of God as we looked at last week. We saw that as the real intent of all that we see. It's interesting when we look, it's another statement in the Bible where we see uh, the, a, a, a depiction of of, of Jesus giving of what was going to happen concerning himself. In Matthew 12, chapter 12, it says there was a certain, uh, then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jesus was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of of Man be three days and three nights in the hearts of the earth. From, uh, From our Lord's standpoint, we should see several things. We see that this miracle that we're going to look at here this morning of the raising of Lazarus, and we may even not even get to the actual raising of that till next week. I don't think we probably will be next week. But we're going to see that there was a purpose in this, and it was not designed to be a public demonstration. That's something interesting for us to consider. Remember where it takes place. It's at a funeral. There's not a lot of people there. There's, there's people there, the ones that are, that, that are there to mourn with them. But it's not designed for a public thing. And it's for the demonstration of the most important thing, the person of Christ. But rather, it's really there for the... For, for the, uh, for, for, for the uh, 
authentication to the disciples of, most important, his person. His person. Focus should be on his person, on Jesus Christ, that he is the Messiah. Peter, as their spokesman, had said in Matthew 16, 16, we see that they all confess their faith in him, in him as the Messiah. Thomas, as we saw last week, anticipated his own death as well as that of Christ in coming to Jerusalem. As we saw in verse 16, when it says, Then said Thomas, which is called De uh, De uh, De De Didymus, uh, unto his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. You see, I think this is an important statement here. It tells us, as we've already read about, we know the, the number of times that we see how they have threatened to kill Jesus and actually attempted to and have been able to. Everything is in God's hands and in his timing, isn't it? Even our lives, our death, everything else. The Lord knows all of that. He knows exactly what tomorrow holds. He knows exactly what's going on. <clears throat> and he's ultimately in control of all of it, isn't it? Particularly so with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it was not his time when the time came was to be right. We see how he so often just disappears out of the midst of the people. We don't know what happened. But the Bible tells us he simply disappears. Or doesn't disappear, but he just goes right through the crowd. And here they were attempting to kill him. So we see this, but he was thinking this. But So they, he honestly believed that just by simply going that this was going to cost them their lives. But it shows the, just the intensity of the hatred for Christ there was in Jerusalem at that time. It was very, very serious. So we see the purpose of the miracle of the restoration of, of, of Lazarus was to confirm the faith of those who had believed in him. So we think about that for a few minutes. This is going to be to help, help strengthen those disciples for what's going to come after this. It's for them to see and understand better his resurrection and what all of this means and what it all, how, how it all ties together. And Jesus says, I am, please notice that word, I am the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection. In verse 17, it goes on to say, Then when Jesus came, he found that he, being Lazarus, had laid in the, two, in the grave for four, four, four days already. And we, of course, at this time, there was still the progress of the morning was still taking place. All of that morning was going on. And we see that all of this we've already mentioned was in God's divine timing and in God's divine purpose as well. Drink a little water here. <clears throat> Let us realize that our Lord knows the hairs upon our head. Doesn't he? He knows our thoughts. He knows everything that's going on. He knows every second of every day, everything that's happening, everything that's going on. It's not that he's too busy doing this over here, or too busy doing that. So all of this that's taking place is, again, it's in God's divine timing and in his divine purpose. In verse 18, it goes on to say, Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now it would seem from these few verses we can take a few things away from it. A furlong, well, we're looking at right around just a couple of miles from Jerusalem, so we can see how close Bethany was to Jerusalem. But we also see that uh, I believe that Lazarus, his sisters, this family had a lot of respect. Because we see a couple of things that are given to us here, it says many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary. So we, you know, that we talk about the Jews as being primarily the leadership, don't we? And those that oppose him. But we also talk about there were many that did believe on the Lord at the same time, weren't there? But so he was, a, it seemed like that they were a pretty well-respected family. And I'm going to say probably a pretty well-to-do family. I wouldn't say they were necessarily wealthy, but they were well-to-do. This was a pretty good crowd. I would think still a pretty good group that were there. And uh, they had plenty of room in their home to accommodate all these people for all of these days. So we learn a little bit about this here. And then it goes on to seem that uh, in verse 20, it says, Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that, that Jesus was coming, went and met him. 
But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. You know, it seems like <clears throat> we look at this and we actually have, I would say, a subtle or a very humble rebuke from her. Now, we can understand her state, can't we? The love that she had for her brother, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing what he had done and could do, and he didn't come when they asked, and he didn't do what they wanted him to do when they were asking for it. And, you know, I'm the friend. I'm the one that's been, I love you so much, and yet you didn't come. So we can kind of understand what goes on here a little bit. But we see also, in spite of her reprimand here, Martha confesses a real, strength, a, a, a real faith still in Christ, I, I think. Please notice what she says here in verse 22 when it says, but I know, she goes on to say, but I know that even now, whatsoever thou ask of God, God will give it thee. That's faith, isn't it? I'm not giving up on you. Her faith, in my humble opinion, was is in, unfathomable. She had a tremendous faith. She didn't lose her faith through all this. I think we can certainly say she was certainly disappointed, and disappointed more than that, was in true despair and couldn't understand why this had all happened the way it had, thinking it could have been so different, as we often do. You know, God, I know how you should have done this, and you didn't do it that way. Does that happen? Have you not been there? I know I have. But she still knew that she could trust the Lord. A little bit of a rebuke there from mom, or he gives a rebuke back to her about that, and then he does it anyway. We see that kind of a pattern of his. A lot of times we'll see where he, in a sense, he doesn't necessarily, he kind of denies it for whatever reason, but then he'll do it a little later. But that was a good example. But yes, we can see that. And we see that, uh, we see that the Lord affirms that Lazarus, that Lazarus was going to be restored. As we look at verse 23 here, and he, when Jesus says unto her, Thy brother shall rise. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. You see, Martha didn't really immediately understand. Many times we can read things and understand, I think we understand things, but we really don't understand exactly what we think we understand. Not what God intends, not, not the real truth that's being given here. Yes, what she says is true. Because you see, she took Jesus' words to affirm that the Old Testament doctrine of the resurrection, that the Messiah would rise from the dead, and he was coming to set up his kingdom. We know that from Daniel, right? If you knew about Daniel, we know in, in Isaiah, for example, in, in chapter 26, it, uh, the Word of God says, uh, Thy dead men shall, shall live, together with, with my dead body shall they rise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indig indignation be overpassed. Now, you know, some people, of course, you get a lot of different opinions on a lot of different things, as we mentioned before. The Bible is the Bible, and it's always true, but sometimes there's different ways of seeing the interpretation. Sometimes, maybe two, both, both ways could be true. But some see this as, a, as particularly, because it does involve the Jewish people, uh, being safe from the Antichrist, to the fury of the Antichrist, referring to their deliverance that they would see it that, uh, uh, later on. But others see it, and I think Spurgeon was one of them, sees it more likely that speaking of the refuge and the safety and the security of God's people when they are caught up together with the Lord in the air. When is that? What's that called? The rapture, right? The rapture. The rapture that's coming. And escape the real horrible indignation of the Lord as he pours out upon the world in the great tribulation, which will immediately precede the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ again in that day. But either way, there was an understanding, a vague understanding in a sense, not as clear certainly as we have in the New Testament with the instruction that we're learning from our Lord. And as we see throughout the Gospels, 
But there was an understanding and they were looking forward to to the day the Messiah was going to come and deliver them. And here was the Messiah and he here he was, he could deliver them, but they were going to refuse him and he knew that too. Doesn't mean it was any less of a, of, of a, uh, of a uh, sincere offer for that salvation. In verse 21 now, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. This is our Lord and Savior saying with un, uh, without any, 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 uh, any uh, conditions here that I am the resurrection and the life. And simple belief is all it is. And that through that we would live. And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. And then he asked the question, Believest thou this? Do you believe this? Do you? Do you really believe this? You see, I am the resurrection and the life. Hope is not in a program. It's not in programs. It's not in something like that. It's what? It's in a person. It's in a person. This is so important in many ways. Too many people are trying to win people to a church, to a denomination, to a particular pastor, a particular this or that. We're believing that some other way they can come. They, all they need to understand is it's about a person. It's about Jesus Christ. He is the resurrection and He is the life. He is that, 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 that person. We need to think about that when we're trying to have a, a, a conversation with somebody about the Lord. People love to get off on the rabbit trails. They love to say, well, I knew a pastor and, you know, this church I went to, and, you know, he was doing this over here, and they were doing that over there, and they were, you know, I don't want anything to do with that. Well, let me just tell you, Mr. Smith, that's not what it's about. What I'm suggesting telling you about is, 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 is the resurrection and the life that comes. It only comes one way, and it comes by Jesus Christ. And that's the answer. It's Jesus Christ. It's not about any of that. Let's not talk about all this other stuff. The faults, we can go on all day. There's all, all kinds of faults. Is there a perfect church? I don't believe there's one. The perfect church is in Christ. He talks about that church too. It's not in a person. The resurrection and the life are in Him. Jesus did not claim to have resurrected, uh, Jesus does not claim to have resurrection and life or understand secrets about the resurrection and life. Instead, Jesus really dramatically says, He is, or I am, the resurrection and the life. Think about that. To know Jesus, to know Jesus is to know resurrection and life. And to have Jesus is to have resurrection and life. God only can really say such a thing in truth, can He not? And I want you to think about this just a minute. This is so true. You see, others may say, well, you know, he, he, knows all, he knew all the secrets about the resurrection. Well, of course he knows all things, but that's not it. He gives them the absolute answer, and it's a simplistic answer, isn't it? I am. I am the resurrection and the truth. There is none other. This is the whole answer, and it's me. It's so much pointing to him and his deity. You know, death comes to the ungodly man as pitiful and inflicted. But to the righteous, it says, being summoned to his father's palace. This is what Spurgeon says. To the sinner, it is an execution. To the saint, he calls it an undressing. Death to the wicked is the king of terrors. Death to the saint is the end of terrors. And the commencement of glory. Of glory. Oh man, do you ever just kind of think, I know we all do. We look in the Word of God and we see little glimpses of, the, of, of, of what heaven's going to be like. But you know, we don't get that much light because we can't handle it. <laughs> Even the little glimpses we can't handle. But it's like you get a little crack in the door and you see, wow, what eternity is going to be like with the Lord. The bliss, as we begin to truly come to know the Lord for who, we, for who He is, as we know Him, through the resurrections, we know Him as we, learn to, as we learn of Him. We become more and more like Him, see things more and more as we see them. We see the whore in the world. 
But the biggest thing is, is we begin to see that the, with the Lord, how eternal everything is, you're not going to be bored. They're not going to be bored. Eternity is a long time. 70 years plus is a long time, and I can get pretty bored. I'm not going to get bored. Think about that. It's going to be a wonderful experience. I'm not going to have all those down times, feeling bad times, all that sort of stuff. It's going to be so different. We can't even begin to, to understand it. You know, Jesus further instructed Martha by saying and asking her, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You know, one who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. But not only that, it's a present possession. If you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior here this morning, it is a current possession. You cannot lose it. You already have it. Isn't that a blessing? Can we not forget that we have it? <laughs> Seems like, or can we not kind of walk away from him sometimes and forget all that we really have there? You see, one who possesses eternal life can never die. Physical death certainly can be interrupted. But the continuation of eternal life, no. One who possesses eternal life may experience the separation of soul from the body, but can never experience the separation of the soul from God. Can we? And we also know that as a child of God here this morning, that we have a new body awaiting us, don't we? A perfect body. One that we cannot even imagine here what it's going to be like to have the one that we are going to have. You know, it's going to be so, so different. And it's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a perfect body if we can imagine that. We can't really imagine that, but we can just think about it. You know, Christ was speaking these words to really kind of try to bring comfort to Martha because Lazarus had believed in Christ. He was really not dead, was he? Because he had eternal life. In verse 27, it goes on to say, it says, she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. We see her faith, don't we? She believed and she confesses this. She affirms, and this, you know, this affirmation is almost identical to what we see what Peter said in, in Matthew chapter 16, when he said, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now going back to Martha's confession, Martha confessed, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. See, very similarities in here, which should come into the world. You see, Martha confesses her faith in his person. His person, not an institution. It's about Christ. Our faith is in Christ. Putting our faith in Him. Also through the confirming work that He had to have a faith that she'd seen in, 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 in Him as we should see. When you look at our Bibles today, my friends, and we look at the things that the Bible shares with us and tells us, and we see the answered prophecies so much in the Bible, we see things that there's no way that they could be other than they were divinely uh, discerned, divinely given to us by God Himself, that we can honestly say, you know something? This is, this is a holy book. The Bible doesn't, doesn't say it's going to be about 85% true or 90% true. You've got to give a little bit of leeway in it. No. It says what it says is true. All true. 100% true. Never changing. That truth is forever. It's eternal truth. Yes, my friends. We have, what a blessing we have in our day and time. <clears throat> Calling him the Son of God refers to him as the Christ or the Messiah who was redeemed. Who, who was to redeem and to reign. Martha's fear would now rest because of her faith in Christ. I think she could really take comfort now. And no matter what it was, she was confident 
because of the, her, 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 uh, the, 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 the conversation she'd had with the Lord. <clears throat> we think of the term Son of God. You know, Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. Most of us certainly in this room understand that. But you know, we see that term over 42 times in the New Testament, the Son of God. The Son of God literally um, affirms the deity of Christ, doesn't it? It is, a, it, it, it is affirming that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, God. Now we look at, at when our Lord weeps. If you look now at verse 28, when it says, And when she had so, so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come, and calleth for thee. As soon as she had heard that, she rose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into town, but was at the place where Martha met him. The Jews, when they, <coughs> the Jews, the Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw Mary, uh, <coughs> let me do that verse again. And the Jews, when, uh, and the Jews then, which which were, were which were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw Mary, that she arose up hastily and went out followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave, to, the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. I want us to think about a word here. We saw the word master in the very first uh, uh, on verse 28. The master has come. That also can be interpreted in instructor or doctor or teacher. And I want you to notice something, the word the in front of it. Notice how it says the teacher or the master has come. Martha is speaking of Jesus as the teacher. Not a teacher, not just a teacher, but the teacher. Among Jesus' followers was the designation primarily by, by was, was primarily de designated by, by his activities. In other words, they, they referred to him by what by what he did and what they were thinking about as they spoke about this was his teaching remember all of the teaching that christ was doing all of the time so they saw him as the teacher the teacher among them and his activities but he's recognized as a teacher that is incomparable to any other teacher he is the teacher another interesting thing that we see in this which is more relevant even today because we miss this point today we don't have this issue but in those days, it's important to notice the use of the term by a woman. The rabbis refused to instruct women. It was that kind of society. It was a man's world. And the women, women weren't going to be away with it. But when Jesus preached, he preached to all. We see that. Jesus obviously took a very different view. So we see the attitude of Jesus. Jesus created a specific role for man, a specific role for woman, and we have, a, as we do in the Bible, as God has ordained us to be, we are, we are whole as a whole. But one is not above the other or, or, or under the other, is it? But we're, but we're appointed to different responsibilities and different things in each, each one of our lives. And it's to be taken seriously. And God has made us who we are. Not the government, but God did. We're either a man or a woman. God knew from eternity past what you were going to be. He knew the choices we were going to make as well. But it is He that has designated us with the glorious uh, opportunities that we have in the, in the sexes that we are today as well. But now notice how Mary responds. In verse 32 it says, And then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw Him, she fell down at His feet and saying unto Him, Lord, if Thou had been here, my brother had not died. Notice how she almost says verbatim what her sister had said. But there's a difference. I want you to think about the difference here just a minute in how it was said. The way Martha comes across, most, most commentators see it as a rebuke almost, as she was obviously upset and in despair that Jesus, God hadn't done what, uh, the Lord hadn't been there for four for them when they really needed him. But with Mary, what do we see? She comes and she falls down on her knees before him. 
she comes in humbly and makes this statement that, you know, Lord, if you'd just been here, this wouldn't have happened. Yes. Now looking at verse 33. When Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have ye laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. Now notice verse 30, 35. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? What are they suggesting here? They're suggesting, guess what? He can't do all things. He really can't do it all. You see, he failed here because he, did, he wasn't here in time to do what needed to be done. It wasn't, it wasn't like they were necessarily rebuking him or anything like that. I believe it was just what they really felt and, and thought at that particular time. And we see how the Jews were weeping with him. And we see how Jesus shares in their grief here as well. And I want you to think about a few minutes as we think about that here, what Jesus, how Jesus responds when he weeps. Behold how they loved him. You know, we see how much, how much compassion and love that the Lord has. And this is going to be, I think, a lesson for us here this morning. Let us understand that the Lord has that compassion and love for you and for me and your circumstances and your needs and my needs. He knows those. He knows them all. But he does, as a man, have a different... He, he, he is a man. He shares that grief and mourning, but yet, but, but yet, unlike any other, God, the Son of Man, was actually able to do something about it, wasn't he? Jesus allows his sympathetic passion to uniquely do for, for Jesus what he will do one day for all of the righteous dead. Think about that. Here, was, in, here is, 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 was and is a great truth of the resurrection for all that trust in Christ. You see, when we look at this particular story of Lazarus, we see a picture of what is going to become shortly with the Lord. But there's also another picture here, isn't there? Isn't there a picture of what's going to happen with you and I, the children of God, those that have put their trust in Him, to see and actually witness the resurrection of someone that has been dead, now is going to be risen? There are many aspects of these two words that Jesus wept. Jesus, first of all, was truly a man, wasn't He? We know from the Bible He was 100% man, just He was 100% God. That's right. You're getting ahead of me again. You got to watch him. He's always jumping ahead of my lesson. <laughs> but you got it. That's exactly right. That's the whole point here we want to see. But we want to see a couple other things. There's, there is no, no sin or shame in tears, is there? You know, we think of that. Men are taught, you know, you don't cry. Well, I'm going to tell you what. Jesus cried. If Jesus can shed tears, wow. I don't know how it can be any less manly than that. You know? He was acquainted with grief. We see that. We, uh, we, we, we have grief in our life all the time. He knows what grief is. He wasn't ashamed of his humanity either, was he? No, he wasn't. And he identified with others in their sorrow. You see, Jesus loved people. Jesus had humanity, but it was in, in total perfection, wasn't it? He suffered all the innocent infirmities of our nature as well jesus dignified tears with others in the bible who wept and all who wept we think of abraham wept when he had to bury sarah jacob wept when he wrestled with the angel david and jonathan wept together didn't they hezekiah wept over his sickness 
Joshua wept over the sins of his nation. And Jeremiah, we know him as the weeping prophet, don't we? Weeping is good. There's nothing wrong with shedding tears in the right way. Sometimes we're told if we really believe that our friends would, would rise again and, they should, and that they're safe and happy even now, we should not weep. I don't know about that. It's pretty hard when you lose a real loved one not to weep, even though we know where they're at. Even though we know that they're in a better place with the Lord, that's all wonderful and good, and we need to look at that aspect of it and know that and to be confident in that. But we can also weep, and those tears are, I think, more for ourselves, for the loss that we're suffering now at this point. There cannot be any error which follows Jesus who leads the way. Yes, we see these things. You know, one thing about our God, He is the only God. There is no other God. When I say our God, the world sees other gods, but there's only one God, and that is the God of, that we know in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's the only God that there is. But other gods, you know, they're a stern. They have no feeling, even their gods. Their primary characteristics is the total ability to, to not feel, have any emotion at all. The Greeks believed in an isolation, that their gods were to be isolated, passionless and, compassionate, and, and, and compassion, compassionateless with God. That isn't the God of the Bible at all, is it? The God of the Bible that we know is a God of true love, isn't it? A God of love that we can't even begin to fathom the depth of His true love for us. And the opportunity that he had and the price that he was willing to pay to make a way for us that didn't deserve anything. Yes, my friends. We, by God's grace, are his children. If you're here as a child of God this morning. And we have nothing to fear but fear itself. There's nothing in this world that can touch us because we're not of this world. We, are, we have an eternal place already reserved for us in heaven. But God has purpose and need and things for us to be doing today that we're to do. We can, become, we can be confident no matter what circumstances we're in, what we may be facing, and just because it's not happening the way we think it should happen, the way God should do it, we need to understand that we can have complete confidence that His ways are not our ways. And we can be confident that His ways are always the perfect and, and infinite way that all things should be. And it's infinite in perfection and in love. And we can be confident in that. What a blessing it is to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, isn't it? And to know that we can turn to Him at any time. That will go ahead and close. Pastor, would you close this morning, please, brother?